Section 9.1, the conic sections. So in short, the conic sections are the curves called the parabola, the ellipse, and the hyperbola. Uh, you may have worked with these before, say in a pre-calculus class. Uh, the one for sure that you've all worked with before is the parabola to the extent that when you were working with quadratic functions in college algebra, parabola is the name you gave to the shape of the graph of a quadratic function. Uh, there is a lot more to it than that, and that's what this section is about. Um, so let's write two items here, and these would be the two ways that we can uh, come to an understanding of what these curves are and what they mean. And the first one I'll call uh, conic sections, which is the title of this section, and I'll talk about that here just in a second. Uh, the other way we can look at these curves we can look at each one of them as a locus of points. And in a few minutes when we get to that, I'll explain what I mean by a locus of points. Okay, so first let's talk about this number one conic section approach. So again, really this is two approaches to developing the ideas of the parabola, the ellipse, and the hyperbola. The first is the conic section. And what that refers to is this picture. So what you see here in brown are two cones. Uh, you can think of the top cone as being inverted and then touching the cone on the bottom at the tip. Um, when you put these two cones together in a system like this, uh, you call them NAPPs. That's N-A-P-P-E. So there's an upper NAP and a lower NAP. Those are just the names for the upper and lower cones in this hourglass shape that you see. Alright, so imagine that this is in 3D, so there's that hourglass, and you can see that in blue there I have a plane. So if I put the uh, hourglass flat on the table, I can see that blue plane is parallel to the table, flat plane. Okay, what am I doing with that blue plane in the picture? I am intersecting this surface. And again, even though when I look at this, I see a solid hourglass, let's just think about the surface boundary of that hourglass. And so when I intersect this surface of this lower nap of this double cone pair, uh, what do I get when I intersect with this blue plane that is perpendicular to this dashed axis line and that's the line that goes right down through the middle of the two cones what do I get when I intersect that bottom nap with this blue plane where that blue plane is perpendicular to that dashed line and it's pretty clear that I get a circle okay now Notice what happens if I tilt the plane just a little bit up. Okay, it's not a plane anymore. In fact, let me tilt it just a little bit more so you can see it a little better. When I look straight down, it looks like a circle. But if I tilt it a little bit, you should be able to see it's not a circle. It's an elongated circle. It's an oval and that is the shape that we call the ellipse. Alright, so what we're saying here is if I take this plane and I tilt it just a little bit, the curve of intersection, the closed green curve that you see that I get when I intersect this lower nap with that plane is called an ellipse. So again, if the plane I'm intersecting the nap with is not perpendicular to that main axis anymore. That is, if you want to think about it this way, the angle between the horizontal and the plane is now greater than zero. And for all of those different angles, I get different ellipses. And obviously, the further up I go, the more elongated the ellipse gets. And now you can really see the effect. Okay, now let's pause for just a second and just make sure we understand why we're calling these conic sections. Sections as in cross-sections 
I am obtaining these curves by taking cross sections or slices of this bottom map in this cone system with this blue plane. Now, the question is what happens if I keep going? And you'll notice if I tilt the plane a little bit further, uh, the, the thing you may be thinking about ahead of time is something may happen at the point if I turn this system sideways where that plane is parallel to, if I can get it to stay there, almost. And you can see it in red there, it just doesn't want to stick. There it is. Okay. So as you look at these cones from the side, uh, the thing you may be thinking is, what happens when that plane is parallel to the edge of that upper nap? Uh, by the way, I'm not going to go through all the usual terminology here. It's not really essential for us in this class, but uh, I would call the edge of that cone a generator line. That is, if I talked about the line that was right along the edge of that brown cone on top, it's parallel to that blue line. And you can see when I tilt back into 3D that what I have now is a parabola. And if I go back now and rotate back down, you can see that when I was here, I was actually producing a closed curve. Well, if you tilt this guy up, where that blue plane is parallel to the edge of that upper cone, then what you see is a parabola. Now, what happens once I pass that? Actually, I'm sorry, I was, I was supposed to be on red there and I couldn't quite click into that position. Okay, there it is. What happens when I click past that point? You do realize now that that if I turn it sideways, now that that blue line is no longer parallel to the edge, edge of that upper nap, that means somewhere way, way far up, if I keep going up, this plane is going to now be intersecting the upper nap as well. In fact, if I tilt a little bit further, you can see it. Uh, just realize when I say somewhere up further, what I mean is these cones, if they were extended up and down forever, then of course even out here that blue plane would be intersecting that upper nap somewhere way up off screen. Uh, now if I move it to that position you can see it a little better and you can see that of course since there is an intersection of the plane with the bottom nap and the upper nap now the intersection consists of two pieces. Okay and that graph that you're looking at is called the hyperbola. Um, if you talked about these, say in pre-calculus, uh, it may have been said that it kind of looks like two parabolas facing away from each other. Okay, uh, those two shapes are definitely not parabolic. Of course, they do resemble parabolas. All right, so to recap here, a circle, those are ellipses and I'm getting those by intersecting the bottom cone with a plane that is tilted at an angle, an angle that is greater than zero but less than that angle right there where it's red. Anything less than that would give me an ellipse, but when my angle is exactly well, okay, I'm not going to get there. It is exactly at that angle. I have a parabola. Now, if I tilt at an angle greater than that, what I'm going to get is a series of hyperbolas. Now, what happens if I tilt it way up here, not quite vertical? Well, of course, I'm getting a sharper hyperbola, and I'd say the two pieces of that hyperbola seem to be getting closer together there in the middle. Now what happens if I rotate this all the way up? Well you should see now that what you get is a pair of intersecting lines. Okay question, what else can you get with this? We know we can get a circle.
we know we can get what we're calling an ellipse. We know we can get the parabola. We know we can get hyperbolas. We know we can get a pair of intersecting lines. Okay, realize that I can also if I can get this back to the red and get it to stay there. Okay, there we go. Okay, now of course that was our parabola. Now if I tilt the plane at that angle but also shift it up so that that plane goes through that origin, you should be able to see there that the intersection of that plane and that system of two cones is a line. That is the plane is touching the edge of each of the cones in just a line. And that line goes through the point where those two cones touch, so it's a common line. All right, so let's put this all together. What are we seeing so far about the different curves that we can get when we intersect this plane with these two naps? We can get a circle. We can get this closed curve we're calling an ellipse. We can get the parabola. We can get the hyperbola. We can get a pair of intersecting lines. Looks like we can also get a line. Uh, you should notice there's one more obvious thing we can get. What do I get if the plane is flat again, but it's going through that point where the two naps touch? Well, it will intersect just at that point. So the other solution I could get to this intersection question is a single point. So putting that all together, we can get a circle, we can get an ellipse, we can get a parabola, we can get a hyperbola, we can get a pair of intersecting lines, we can get a line, we can also get just a point. Okay, so when you hear people talk about the conic sections, what they mean is arriving at these curves by doing intersections of a plane with this double nap cone. Now, this is a pretty neat way to look at these, but it's not very useful for us to for a lot of reasons. Uh, the main reason is to find intersections of surfaces I would only have to know how to deal with geometry and three space. That is, I would have to know how to write equations for surfaces. I'd have to know how to solve systems of equations of surfaces to find equations for curves of intersections of those surfaces. And that's not really something that we've done. It's, it's a Calc 3 thing. So theoretically, uh, we won't really dabble in that much when we get to Calc 3, but when we get to a certain point in Calc 3, we would have the tools to be able to find the equations for these various curves, like the ellipse and the hyperbola and the parabola, by actually finding intersections of the equations of the surfaces that we're talking about, where the surfaces are this system of cones and this blue plane. Okay, that gives you a nice visual about what these curves are. Uh, but again, not, not a very useful one for this class. So this is where we go back to the other way or the other interpretation we have, which is as a locus of points. Okay, what do I mean by locus? Well, you, you've seen this before uh, when you talk about the circle. Pretend that's a circle. When you first talk about the circle, uh, let's say in a beginning algebra class when you're doing coordinate geometry, or even in high school geometry when you're just doing basically Euclidean proofs, uh, what, what is your basic definition of a circle? Uh, it sounds something like it's the set of all points that are equidistant from a common point called the center. And of course that's exactly what a circle is. To be a point on this circle means you are at a certain fixed distance from this point you call the center and every other point that qualifies to be on that circle is at that same distance from that point you call the center. The collection of all of those points is what I would call a locus. A locus is a collection of points um, that describe a curve that has some particular geometric interpretation, some meaningful interpretation. In this case, the locus of points we're talking about is the set of all points that are equidistant from a fixed point. And that locus of points is a circle. 
Okay, and it turns out that all of the conic sections are also meaningful locus of points. That is, when I draw the graph of a parabola, it's not just some random shape that happens to be the shape of the graph of a quadratic function. Um, actually, the way we approach the graph is a little haphazard in algebra. We introduce the quadratic function, we talk about how to solve quadratic equations, and then almost magically we come to this shape and just give it the name parabola. And there's really no meaning to that shape other than we made a table of points, plotted them, and connected the dots, and called that U-shape a parabola. When actually the parabola has a very definite meaning uh, in terms of the geometry of the relationship of those points to each other in that graph. So that's what we'll talk about now. Um, so let me erase this. And let's write the real definition for a parabola. OK, definition. A parabola is the set of points in the plane that are equidistant. So that sounds a little bit like the beginning of a circle definition. Except what again is our circle definition? It's the set of all points that are all equidistant from one fixed point. Okay, that's the locus definition for a circle. On the other hand, the parabola is the set of all points in the plane that are equidistant from a point and parenthetically I'll say called the focus and a fixed line called the directrix. Okay, and just to uh, show you a quick picture of that, so rather than draw a picture, let's look at this applet. So of course you see a you see a parabola there, and you can see the vertex, and we're familiar with, with that from college algebra. All right, what else do I see there? Um, I see this point labeled focus, so that little black point. And actually, let me, let me move this down a little bit. Okay, you can see the black point, that's the focus. And you can see the horizontal black line at the very bottom, which is labeled directrix. OK, notice when I drag this B point, the green point, around that graph of the parabola, you can see that the two distances that the applet is tracking are staying the same. OK, what are those two distances? The first distance is the distance from B down to that focus point. The other distance is the vertical distance straight down to that horizontal directrix line. And we're saying what makes a parabola a parabola is that if you pick any point on that graph, those two distances from the point on your graph to this focus point and down to this directrix line have to be equal. Um, now, what is it that's really determining the shape of the parabola? It's where that focus point is located. Notice if I move the focus point farther away from the vertex, the parabola widens up. But you can see that when I do that, when I drag that B point around, those two distances still stay the same. Actually, you can see what happens when I move closer. That is, when I move the focus closer to the vertex, it looks like those common distances are getting smaller. So we're saying they're all the same. What happens when I make the P very small? 
Okay, that's about as small as it'll go on this applet. Well, now those distances are very big up here because this graph has been uh, horizontally compressed. But still, what makes it a parabola is that those distances stay constant. All right, that is our working definition for what a parabola is. So a parabola is a very specific shape. It's not just a U. Uh, so if I just draw any other graph, so for example, if I draw something like y equals x to the fourth, uh, which when I graph it has a U shape, it definitely does not satisfy this characteristic or this property. That is, when I graph a point on that or plot a point on that graph, there is no magical focus point or directrix line to which the distances are equal from that point on the graph. All right, now let's see if we can figure out how to write a general equation for this parabola based on this definition. And so we'll go right from that picture we were just looking at. Now for convenience, let's just have our parabola at the origin here for a minute and we can worry about shifting it around later. Okay, so what we're saying is there will be some focus point which will always be sitting inside the parabola. By inside, I mean here in the interior. And let's say this distance right here is P. Let's call that distance P. If we move down from the origin to negative P and make a little horizontal dashed guideline there, which would be Y equals negative P, that's the line that we're calling the directrix. And what we're saying is this is a parabola, this graph is a parabola if when I calculate the distance from the focus point to the point on my graph and the distance from the point on my graph down to that directrix. Now, of course, my picture is not correct. It's probably not a parabola. And even if it is, my focus point isn't in the right place. But what we're saying is these two distances should be equal. And if I drag the point somewhere else and recalculate those distances, let's say there and there, again, those two distances should be equal. All right, now, with that in mind, let's see if we can write an equation that describes what's happening. So let's draw the picture again. Here's our parabola. Of course, we've got our vertex at 0, 0. We're saying there's this focus point that's located above the vertex and, again, inside the parabola. And we're saying it is P units above the vertex. So let's say that point is 0 P. And then down here, we have this little invisible line that is the same distance on the other side of the vertex. It's just on the opposite side. So that would be Y equals negative P. And then when we pick a point on the parabola, we're saying what? This distance and this distance have to be equal. Okay, what is that first distance? Well, if this point on my graph is a generic xy, what's the distance from xy to 0p? Well, it should be the square root of x minus 0 squared plus y minus p squared. Okay, what's the distance from here to here? That is, what's the distance from my xy point down to this directrix line? Well, that one's easy. If this is a vertical line, it should just be this distance, which is y, plus this distance, which is p, which means this distance is y plus p. Okay, now if you go back and look at the definition we set up here, we set a parabola as the set of points in the plane that are equidistant from a point called the focus. Okay, the distance from my point on the graph to the focus is this guy, 
and then the distance from my point on the graph down to that directrix is this guy. And if those two distances have to stay the same, this equation should be true. And this is the defining equation for a parabola that opens up or down. Now, of course, we also know there are standard parabolas that open sideways, and we'll arrive at the equation for that here just in a minute. All right, now, I'm not going to go through the general proof and all the detail for each of the three conics, but I'm definitely going to do the parabola here in the video because it's, it's quick and easy. All right, so let's do a little algebra here. Let's square both sides. And, of course, if I square both sides, I get x squared plus y minus p squared equals y plus p squared. And then if I clean up the left side a little bit, I get x squared plus y squared minus 2py plus p squared. And on the other side, I get y squared plus 2py plus p squared. And of course, I can see that these are going to cancel out, and these are going to cancel out, which leaves me with x squared equals, and if I move this guy to the other side, 4py is what I'll get. All right, so this is the standard general equation for a parabola with vertex equal to 0, 0, so at the origin, and focus at 0, P, and directrix of Y equals negative P. And you can just take a minute when you're watching the video to make sure these three things I just wrote track with what we drew in the pictures above. Okay, this means, for example, when we write down the standard y equals x squared, which we've been using for eons, so our little parabola that goes through the origin and goes through 1, 1, what I should now be looking at when I see something like that is trying to match that to the equation x squared equals 4py. And if I do that, what I should recognize immediately is that the 4p has to match the coefficient that's in front of the y term, which in this case is a 1. And so if I write those side by side, that is, if I turn this equation around and write it as x squared equals 1y, I can see that 4p is equal to 1, which means p equals 1 quarter. Okay, therefore, what is my new added interpretation of y equals x squared? It's a parabola that opens up with vertex at the origin, and this tells me that there's a focus point at 0, 1 quarter. So if this was 1, 2, 3, 4, let's say this is 1, so right here at 1 quarter is the focus. Which means what else? It means that down here at negative 1 quarter, there is a directrix. And what we're saying now, and again, I'm not trying to I'm certainly not trying to draw this to scale or to draw it perfectly, uh, but we are saying that by the time we get out to 1, 1, so whatever this guy looks like, we're saying that if you picked a random point on this graph and you calculated the distance from the point on the graph to the focus and the distance from that point on the graph straight down vertically to that horizontal directrix line, these two distances would always be equal no matter what point you picked on the parabola. And that would be whether you picked it on the right side of the parabola or the left side. Okay, so if you've seen this before, this looks familiar. If you haven't seen this before, this shows you that there's a bit more to the parabola than just some uh, 
random U shape that we talked about in connection with quadratic functions. In fact, what is the connection? It is this equation right here. And really the big thing is this 4p factor. That's the one that's allowing us to identify the p and that tells us where this focus point is. Okay, I'll do a few more examples of this in, in a little bit here, but uh, let's go ahead and work through the other two conic sections and figure out what those are. Uh, before we do, though, I'll just say, um, again, to recap, x squared equals 4py. Notice that if p is greater than 0, we are talking about a parabola that opens up with its focus at 0 comma p, which would be right there. We did say the focus would be inside the parabola. Uh, but notice if p is less than 0, then 0 comma p would be here, which means this would be a parabola that opens down. And if that's where my focus is, I know y equals negative p would actually be a positive value, and that would be up here. So I would still get my directrix on the opposite side of the origin. It would just be above the x-axis now instead of below. Okay, what's the other thing that could happen? I could have the equation y squared equals 4px. And I'll leave it for you to piece together the details, which shouldn't be too difficult. And you should be able to determine that if p is greater than 0, we're talking about a parabola with its vertex at the origin that opens to the right. And now the focus wouldn't be at 0p. It would be at p0. The directrix would now be on the other side of the y-axis, and instead of a y equals negative p, it would be a vertical line x equals negative p. Okay, what if p is less than zero? We'll just flip it. So now it's a parabola that opens to the left. My focus would be at p zero, but since p is negative, that would be over here. Over on this right side, that would be my directrix. It would be x equals negative p, but that makes sense. If p is negative, negative p would be positive, and that would be in the right place. All right, so these are the four generic situations for your graph of a parabola, and they're all coming from these two equations, and you can see that this one on the right is basically just this one on the left with the x and the y swapped. All right, let's talk about the ellipse next. So the ellipse is defined to be the set of points. So again, an, another locus of points whose distances from two fixed points and those points would be called foci, plural for focus, so there's two of them. So set of points whose distances from two fixed points called foci in the plane have a constant sum. Now I have a nice little applet for this, but I, I couldn't find it, so uh, we're, we're just going to be uh, sloppy here and talk through it. But let's say I have two fixed points in the plane. And we are going to, in this first section, be talking about standard ellipses, that is where the two foci lie in a horizontal line or in a vertical line. Just like when we talked about parabola a few minutes ago, we talked about parabolas in which the vertex and focus 
both lie in a vertical line together or both in a horizontal line together. All right, so let's let's consider two fixed points both lying in the same horizontal line. And it says what? To be on the graph of a so-called ellipse. So if I had a point up here that was on the graph of this ellipse thing that we're going to get for a picture here in a minute, what makes that red point be on the graph of ellipse? Well, when I take the distance from that point to this one focus, and I take the distance from that point to the other focus, the sum of those two distances has to be a constant. That is, if I move to another point on the ellipse, let's say this green point was another point on the graph of the ellipse, um, obviously this distance is not the same as this one. And then of course if I take the distance from that point down to the other focus, that's not the same as this red one we had a little while ago. But what we're saying is when I add up these two green distances, these two distances from this point on the graph to those two foci, the sum of those two distances will be the same as the sum of the two red distances. It's a constant sum. All right, now, the, the applet I mentioned, uh, if we were in class, we could do this on a, on a table with a piece of string. In fact, if you've done this before, if you talked about ellipses and pre-calculus, you may have done this in class. Um, if you imagine these two points as being push pins, and let's say you had a fixed length of string, let's say this red piece that I'm drawing here is a piece of yarn or a piece of string, and let's say you have push pins at each end of the string. And let's say you've pulled the string taut, like so. So here, let me draw it again. Two push pins, a fixed length, length of string, and so, you know, the string might be like this to begin with, but if you pull the string taut with your finger, or let's say with a pencil, then you're pulling it to one point. Now, what happens when you move the pencil or move your hand to the right? Well, you're also going to be forced down because if the length of string is constraining you because you can't change the length of string, then when you try to move your pencil to the right, the fixed length of string is also going to move your pencil down. Okay, and when you do that, what's going to happen is you're going to end up following a curve that looks like that. That is, as you move the pencil, the only way you can keep that length of string fixed is if you produce this curve, this particular shape. And that shape is the ellipse. And that's a pretty terrible picture, but you can see that there is some invisible line of symmetry that should be dividing that into a top and bottom and there should also be some line of symmetry vertically that divides it into those two halves and what we're saying is no matter where you land on this ellipse if you calculate the distance from that point to that focus and from that point to the other focus the sum of those two distances will be the same no matter what point you pick on this ellipse, meaning the sum of these two red distances will be the same as the sum of those two blue distances. And that will be the same as the sum of those two orange distances. They're all the same. That's what makes the elliptical shape. All right, now, let me get rid of that messy picture, and let's draw a simpler one. So the shape you would end up generating with that tracing with the pencil and the piece of string is this oval shape, and it does turn out that those focal points, those foci, are inside 
So if I'm viewing this as a closed curve, they sit inside. In fact, let's call this C0, and let's call this negative C0. There are definitely four extremes in the picture. That is, this point that is furthest up, this one furthest down, this one furthest right, this one furthest left. Um, there is a symmetry, as you'll see here shortly, and you should be able to intuit that symmetry from what we just described with the string and the push pins. I'll say that one of these is longer than the other. That is, this one, that is the distance between the two extremes on the left and the right, or this distance between the two extremes up and down. One of those is larger. Uh, let's just say in this picture the red one is the bigger one, the larger length. And let's say the green is the smaller one. Okay, if that's the case, I'm going to call this point out here a comma zero, which means this point up here by symmetry will be negative a zero. I'm going to call this point at the top b zero, and I'm going to call this point down here negative b zero. Okay, what would happen? if the ellipse was stretched out longer the other way, and that's pretty terrible looking ellipse, but you get the idea. Then of course, where would the foci be? Well, what we're suggesting is that they would lie along the longer piece of whichever axis this extends along the longest. In fact, let's give this a name now. Um, in our picture, I had this shaded in red. So actually that line segment that I have shaded in red there, let's call that the semi-major axis. And really what I'm saying is in this first picture, the x-axis is the major axis. It's the axis along which the ellipse opens widest or longest. The semi-major axis is just this line segment that runs from the one end of the ellipse on the left to the other end on the right. Okay, the shorter line segment, the one that goes from top to bottom in this picture, I'm going to call that the semi-minor axis. And of course that means in our picture the y-axis is the so-called minor axis. Okay, and you, you can intuit, I think, that if I turn this thing around and have it opening longer up and down, that now I would say in this picture the y-axis is the major axis and the x-axis is the minor axis. And we're saying that the focus points would lie somewhere on that major axis. And so I'm going to label this A0, I'm sorry, 0A, I should say. And this one I'll call 0, negative A. And then out here, that one's going to be called this is really an awful picture. I think we can do a little bit better. Just getting really, really sloppy there. All right, so we're calling this point 0A. We're calling this point 0, negative A. We're calling this point over here B0. And we're calling this point negative B0. And I see now that I was also being sloppy up here. Obviously that should be 0B, and this point should be 0, negative B. Okay, so what I'm suggesting here, just to make it clear, is that the length of the semi-major axis 
is 2a, where a is a positive number. And I'm saying the length of the semi-minor axis is 2b, where b is positive. Meaning when I write equations for ellipses, which we're going to do here in a minute, I'm always going to, it's always going to be understood that A is bigger than B and that the length of the, the major axis or the semi-major axis is 2A because I'm going to start in the middle and go A in both directions and I'm either going to go left and right or up and down. Um, so it means what? If I give you a picture like this, let's say, um, where let's say this is negative 5, and this is 5, and this is 3, and this is negative 3, what you should be able to tell me immediately is that A is 5, and that B is 3. When I see that it opens wider lengthwise in the vertical direction, then I know right away this is the semi-major axis, and the length of that is 10, and by symmetry, of course, I know half of that is the A value, and that's 5. Similarly, the semi-minor axis is this line segment, and half of that by symmetry is 3, so B equals 3. Likewise, if I had an ellipse that looked like this, and this was 7, and this was negative 7, and this was negative 2, and this was 2, I would say A is 7, and I would say B is 2. So what I'm labeling as A and what I'm labeling as B depends on which way this thing is opening. Whichever way it opens the longest, that's what's going to decide your A. And then whichever direction it's narrower, which in this case is along the y-axis, that decides the B. All right, now, to figure out an equation, an equation, a general equation for the ellipse, we just need to write down an equation that describes that verbal description of what an ellipse is. And of course, what was that description again? It said, if this is my ellipse, and again, I'll just draw one that opens left, right, and we're saying that's A, and that's negative A, and that's B, and that's negative B, and we're saying these focus points are somewhere in here, where that's a C and that's a negative C, then, of course, what makes it an ellipse and is, is when I pick a point on the ellipse, the sum of that distance and that distance is a constant. Okay, what are those two distances? Well, you should be able to see that that first one I drew in red is the distance from negative C0 to, let's say, a generic point XY. And then what's the one in green? That's the distance from C0 to my generic point XY. And we're saying what? When you take this distance and you add this distance, the sum of those two distances is supposed to be some constant. Now we'll figure out what that constant is in a minute. Uh, but first of all, let's just write down what these two distances are. What's the distance from this left focus up to that xy point? Well, using our old distance formula, it should be the difference of the x-coordinates squared, which would be x plus c squared, plus the difference of the y-coordinate squared, which would be y squared, plus the other distance, which again would be the square root of the sum of the squares of the differences of the x-coordinates and the y-coordinates, and we're saying the sum of these two distances should be a constant. All right, now let's see if we can figure out what that constant is. So let's say this is your negative a, let's say this is your a, let's say your focus point is here somewhere, and there's the other one, and so let's say this is one quarter of your lips over there in the first quadrant. And of course we're saying that if I were to pick a point like that, 
the sum of those two distances would be a constant. And of course, we are saying that that would be true no matter where you plot that xy point, right? So for example, it would also be true here. That is right at the top, because that also counts as a point on the ellipse. All right, so that means what? The distance from this left focus up to that generic point on the ellipse and the distance from that point on the ellipse down to the other focus, the sum of those two distances should be constant. Now, let's say you move the push pin all the way down to here. So, of course, this is also another point on the ellipse over here at the right end. All right, now, of course, when you do that, if you imagine this as being a string, then, of course, the string is all going to be lying along the x-axis now. Because, you know, here were your strings, here were your strings, here were your strings. And now when you get to the bottom, basically you're saying, okay, that's not a good color. You're saying your string comes over here and tries to come back to that focus. Something like that, right? Now just imagine that uh, going all the way down to A. And now think about if that happens and you collapse the string all the way down to the x-axis, can you conclude what the length of that string is? And I'm going to let you do that visually, but I'll tell you what you should come up with is 2A. And you should be able to see it pretty easily if you think about this length of string plus this length of string is the same thing as this length of string plus this because this is the same as this. Well, if you take this long green one and you add this one, then what you get is all of this, which is 2a. Okay, what that means is, if we draw the picture one more time, so here's our ellipse, here's our a, here's our negative a, here's our c, here's our negative c, and so if I go back to the picture we had a minute ago where I had the point on the ellipse right there at the top, and we said, well, there's my piece of string, and by symmetry, I know that this piece and this piece are the same. That is, this red piece and this green piece are equal by symmetry. If that's the case, then I know this is A. And in fact, if I draw this triangle, let's just draw an exploded view of that, what you're saying is this is A, and you're saying this bottom side is C. That's just this guy. And then what have we called this up here? Well, that should be B. And so now I should be able to say A squared equals B squared plus C squared. And there is the equation that relates A, B, and C to each other. That's the piece that was missing. So we've come up with two things here the equation that relates a, b, and c, and also that mystery constant sum of all these distances between points on the graph and the two foci, meaning this 2a is the constant that was missing up here. All right, so this equation, which you're not going to, to use at all, really, uh, because we have an easier form that we're going to get to here in a second. But this is really the defining equation based on this locus definition. That is, if you look at that equation, it's exactly what we described in the paragraph when we defined an ellipse. The sum of these two distances is a constant. And that's exactly what this equation says. Now, I'm not going to go through uh, the proof of this, um, 
although I would invite you to. It's, it's not something I'm going to ask you on a test, but uh, it's, it's something you should work out on your own just to try it and see if you can do it. Um, I will say that if you do some algebraic simplification, which would obviously involve getting rid of those square roots, which means you'd have to be squaring both sides of this equation twice. Um, and you can either start out by squaring both sides as is, or you could move one of those square roots to the other side and then square. And you've seen equations like this in the past. When you have an equation that has two radical square root terms like that, uh, you can eliminate both of those square roots by squaring both sides, isolating the remaining square root, and then squaring both sides again. If you do that and then simplify everything, what you'll come up with from this equation, believe it or not, is x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. Now, this assumes that a is greater than b, so that means this would be one that has its major axis along the x-axis and its minor axis along the y-axis. Versus the other equation that you could get, which would be if you started with an ellipse like this that was elongated vertically, which means the a and the negative a would be there, the b and the negative b would be there, and your focus points wouldn't be c0 and negative c0, they would be 0c and 0, negative c. If you start from that picture, the equation you'll get is x squared over b squared plus y squared over a squared equals 1. This would be the equation for an ellipse where, again, notice a is still the bigger one. That doesn't change. But now your major axis is along the y-axis. Minor axis is along the x-axis. really does not like me writing down there. Okay, now, that means what? When you look at these two equations, and this is just a, a thing to note for yourself, when you look at those two equations, how do you know which sort of ellipse you're looking at? What is it that you look at to tell? You look at these two denominators, which of course, since they're squares, will both be positive. And since we're always saying A is the bigger number, you would look for which one of these denominators is bigger. And what we're saying is, if the bigger number is under the x squared, that means this thing opens longer in the x direction, along the x-axis. That is, the major axis lies along the x-axis. If you see that the bigger number is under the y squared, then that tells you you're opening in the y direction. That is, it's elongated this way. So for example, if I had something like um, x squared over 16 plus y squared over 9 equals 1, then of course my eye goes right to the 16, which is the larger denominator. And if I view that as a squared and I view the other one as b squared, then what we're saying is a is 4 and b is 5. I'm sorry, b is 3. Okay, which means what? When I draw this, I will draw a 1, 2, 3, 4 point at 4, 0. And I know that it should be along the x-axis because this larger denominator was under the x squared term. 1, 2, 3, 4 out to the left. This says that I'll go 1, 2, 3 up and 1, 2, 3 down. Now, I haven't used this name yet, but now's the time for it. Those four points, those four points I was calling the extreme points before, let's call those vertices, which means if I asked you what the vertices of this ellipse are, you would say 4, 0, negative 4, 0, 0, 3, and 0, negative 3.
Okay, I'll do my best impression of an ellipse. Now, what's the only other thing you should be able to find on this? You should be able to tell me where the focus points are. Okay, how do you get those? Okay, remember the defining equation we had that related a, b, and c. It was a squared equals b squared plus c squared. Meaning, if I know a and b, I know c squared is a squared minus b squared. Or in other words, c is the square root of a squared minus b squared. And since a squared is always bigger than b squared, I know this makes sense because that will definitely be a positive number. In this case, what is that? It's c equals the square root of a squared minus b squared, which is the square root of 7, which is like 2 point something. So out here at 2 point something, square root of 7 comma 0, and negative square root of 7 comma 0, that would be my two focus points. And of course, that means this is the equation I'm always going to use to figure out the locations of those foci. Okay, now I'll do some more examples shortly here, but let's go ahead and do the third conic to get it out of the way. So the third one is definitely the, the strangest one. So the hyperbola definition. Okay, uh, this definition at first can uh, be a little denser, a little harder to penetrate than the other two definitions, uh, but let's start simple. Uh, it says the hyperbola is the set of all points in a plane whose distances from two fixed points called foci have a constant difference. So remember uh, when we defined the ellipse, it was the set of all points uh, such that when you calculated the, the sum of the distances from that point on the graph to those two foci, the sum of those two distances was a constant. Now we've just switched it to difference. Now, of course, when you take a difference of two distances, depending on which distance is larger, that distance could become negative or positive, or that difference could become negative or positive. So I'm saying here at the end, when we take the difference of those two differences or distances, Let's put an absolute value on it to make it a positive value. All right, so that means if I, to keep it simple here, had two points, let's say, on the x-axis, and let's say those are the foci. So we're saying what? If you pick a point, what makes it appear on a hyperbola? Let me draw it out a little further here. Let's draw it here. Then we're saying when you calculate the distance from that point to one focus point, and when you calculate the distance from that point to the other focus point, when you take the difference of those two distances and then take the absolute value, which in this picture uh, looks like it would be this distance, the bigger one, minus the dashed one, which is the smaller one, that would give me a positive value.
we're saying that if you take the difference of those two and keep that positive difference, that difference should stay constant as you move around this graph of this hyperbola. And this one is not as intuitive. That is, there's no uh, easy, nifty little push pin and string analogy that helps you to see how this thing's being generated. Uh, but I will say that out here beyond the focus point, uh, let's try that again. I don't want them out there. Inside is what I meant to say. So somewhere in here and somewhere in here, there will be two intercepts. Let's call them x-intercepts. And so let me erase this since I'm changing the picture here on you. So if I'm claiming that's the graph of this hyperbola, then what I'm saying is when you pick a point on that hyperbola and you calculate that distance and you calculate this distance, and you take the absolute value of the difference of those two distances, that difference will remain constant. That is, if I picked, let's say, this point, and I took this distance and this distance, and I took the difference of those two distances and took the absolute value, that difference would be constant. It will always stay constant. Now, you know, of course, that I'm going to call these blue points foci. Let's call this one C0. Let's call this one negative C0. I'm going to call those red points, those ones where these two pieces of this hyperbola, and we sometimes call those branches. Uh, I would call this the right branch of the hyperbola, and I would call this the left branch. Uh, these two points that I'm labeling as the vertices also happen to be the x-intercepts. And I'm definitely going to call this one, let's say, uh, a0, and I'll call this one negative a0. Okay, notice in this one, since it's not a closed curve like the ellipse, uh, there isn't going to be another pair of vertices. There's just these two vertices. That means there's no such thing as a major and minor axis. We'll just say there is a focal axis. There is the axis that those vertices and foci lie on and let's call it the focal axis. And of course we are just talking about the same two cases we've talked about with the parabola and the ellipse. We're talking about the hyperbola that has two branches opening away from each other horizontally, but we could also be talking about the hyperbola with two branches facing away, away from each other opening up and down. In the case of the left-right, opening branches, we're saying that the focus points, the foci, would be inside those branches, meaning that the right focus would be to the right of the right vertex, and the left focus would be to the left of the left vertex. Uh, for the up-down picture, we're saying that the foci would again be here and here. That is, the larger focus point, the higher one, would be above the upper vertex, and the focus point at the bottom would be below the lower vertex. All right, now, if we've got the basic idea down, the only thing that remains is what's the equation for this one? And again, if we were really going to plot through all the details, uh, we, we'd have to build our equation. And then if you sort of follow what happened with the ellipse, I, I didn't go through the detail of the proof, but I told you if you did the algebra and simplified that distance equation that I wrote, 
that's how we end up with this really simple, uh, fairly compact equation for the ellipse. The same thing is going to happen for the hyperbola. I'm going to start out with a, a rather strange equation that involves distances with square roots. And so in this one, uh, let's, let's take our picture here. What are we talking about? If we take a point on the ellipse, like say that point, then I know we are looking at the distance from one of the foci to that point and the distance from that point to the other focus. And we're saying the absolute value of the difference of those two distances should remain a constant. Well, what's this first distance, that one right there? Well, again, if this point is negative C0, and this is a generic point x, y on the graph, then I know that blue distance should be square root of x plus c squared plus y squared. So it's the same, uh, same sort of thing we saw when we were doing the ellipse. Except now, I want the difference between that distance and the other distance. Well, what's that other distance in the lime green there? Well, this other focus is C0. And the distance between these two points should be the square root of x minus c squared plus y minus 0 squared. And our definition says the absolute value of the difference of those two distances should be a constant. Now, similar to what happened when we were looking at the ellipse, the question is, what is that distance? Well, let's see. If you remember how we did this with the ellipse, we located a special point on the graph. Uh, in the case of the ellipse, what we did is put the string down here at this point. Okay, here what I want to do is the following. So think about this, and I'll try and use the same picture we've got here. So let's pick this point as our point on the hyperbola. So that x-intercept of that right branch. All right, so what should be true well, if I take the distance from this focus over to that point on the graph, and then I take the distance from this focus to that point on the graph, so that little distance straight along the x-axis in green and that distance along the x-axis in red, what should be true is that if I take the absolute value of the difference of those two distances, that should be that constant that we're talking about in this definition. Well, you should see, of course, that this distance right here is 2a, because this is a and this is negative a. Uh, what's this distance here? Well, that distance is actually c minus a. But what happens when you take the red distance and you subtract this little green distance? Well, that green distance is also c minus a which means when you take the difference of these two distances, you're just, oops, you are just removing that part of the red distance, which means what's left is this 2a. So it, it shouldn't be a huge surprise. The constant in this definition is actually the same as the constant in the definition of the ellipse. It's 2a. And now this becomes the basic defining equation for the hyperbola. Now, of course, we're basing our development of the definition here on this hyperbola that opens left-right. Obviously, it would change a little bit, and it's going to lead to a slightly different equation in the end if it's one that opens up and down, and we'll see what that is here in a minute. Um, Again, I'm not going to go through the algebra here, but I'll say if you were to go through the algebraic manipulation, uh, what you will end up with is x squared over a squared minus y squared over a squared minus c squared equals 1. 
Okay, now I, I, you know, I skipped a lot of stuff to get to that, and it is all basic algebra, but it's it's not necessarily trivial. It's it's something you could try and see if you can figure out how I got to that. Um, you will see though, if you're reading along the book, that this is not the standard basic equation of a hyperbola. Uh, you'll notice if you look in the book there that you'll see where this a squared minus c squared is, they're calling that a b squared. So in fact, what I'm going to do here is artificially define a b squared to be a squared minus c squared. And of course, when I make that definition, I am automatically defining the equation that relates a, b, and c. So now I have artificially inserted this auxiliary variable b or auxiliary parameter, if you want to call it a parameter. And this is the relationship between A, B, and C. So if I know A and C, uh, this is where I get the B from. Or if I knew the A and the B, this is where I would get the C from. Okay, if I do that, then of course this equation becomes X squared over A squared minus Y squared over B squared equals 1. This is where B squared equals a squared minus c squared or if you like uh, it might be easier to call that oops I am sorry apologize here that should be c squared minus a squared I've got my variables backwards and I just realized when I got uh, down to here that I had them backwards so let's change this to uh, let me correct myself I'm going to define b squared to equal c squared minus a squared. And why did I know that was wrong? Because notice that this one is the same thing as c squared equals a squared plus b squared which of course is uh, pleasant sounding because it sounds like your familiar Pythagorean theorem c squared equals a squared plus b squared. All right, so and of course the mistake was that when you simplify algebraically this equation that we've got, what you get right there in that denominator is c squared minus a squared. Um, you should notice why what I had before is incorrect. Uh, partly because you should notice that a is less than c. And if a and c are both positive numbers, uh, that means 2a is less than 2c. And it will certainly mean that a squared is less than c squared. So that means when I take c squared minus a squared, I'll definitely have a positive number. Um, this is, uh, if we were in class, this is where I would stop and, and ask, uh, does everybody see why this is actually true? Uh, and if I just draw a quick picture. Okay, so here's our focus points. And we're saying if we have some point on the ellipse, there's our two distances. Now, by the way, if I were to connect those two focus points, I would have a triangle there. What would the length of the base of that triangle be? It would be 2C. I don't know what those two distances are, but I know that when I take the difference of them and take the absolute value, that is, when I take those two distances, that one and that one, take the absolute value of the difference, that's supposed to be the 2a. Well, I'll leave it for you to piece together there uh, from what you know about triangles, but if I take the difference of the lengths of these two sides and take the absolute value of the difference, that that has to be smaller than the size of the third side. And so actually that justifies that inequality right there. And of course if that one's true, this one is also true. All right, that means this is a positive value, and now this actually makes sense, what I'm saying here. All right, now, what we've got is 
in summary, x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals 1 will give me a hyperbola with its focal axis lying along the x-axis. If, I, however, I have x squared over, actually, let's write it this way. Let's put the positive term first. So the other version would be y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared equals 1. That's what our equation is going to look like if my hyperbola is opening up and down with the focal axis lying along the y-axis. And I'll do examples here in a minute. Uh, but notice when you look at these two, uh, if we look at the one that's opening right and left, again, you're saying that your vertices will be a0 and negative a0. And then, of course, your focus points will sit somewhere to the left and right of those two vertices. If we look at the up and down opening branches, then, of course, now we're saying that your vertices are here and here at 0a and 0, negative a. And now your focus points are somewhere up here above that vertex and somewhere down here on the y-axis below that lower vertex. Okay, that means when you're looking at these equations, how do you know which is which? Um, unlike the ellipse, you're not looking at which one of these denominators is larger now. What you're really looking at is which term is positive because you know now that it's not x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1 anymore. The equations for the hyperbola have this subtraction or negative on one of the terms. And what we're saying is the one that opens left right will have a positive x squared term. The one that opens up down will have a positive y squared. We are then identifying the denominator of the positive term as i squared. I'm sorry, a squared. So let me write that here. Identify the denominator of the positive term, that is the positive variable term, variable term, as a squared. So we're not going by size. In fact, the a squared can be smaller than the b squared. It's the term that's positive that tells us whether it opens or left or right. So I'm emphasizing this so that you avoid confusing this with the ellipse. Remember that for the ellipse, we're looking at the term that has the larger denominator. Here we're looking for the term that's positive, and the denominator of that term is what we're taking as a squared. Okay, before we get to some examples, uh, let's talk about one more thing with the hyperbola. So let's say we've got a standard x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals 1. So there's something sort of curious that happens here. Uh, let's solve this for y. So of course we're going to get y squared over b squared equals x squared over a squared minus 1. Or in other words, uh, if we take the square root, we're going to get y equals plus or minus b times the square root of x squared over a squared minus 1, uh, which we could clean up a little bit and say is y equals plus or minus b times square root x squared over a squared minus a squared over a squared, or in other words, plus or minus b square root x squared minus a squared over a squared, which means we could factor out that a in the bottom, and we'd have a plus or minus b over a times square root 
x squared minus a squared. And there's what we get when we solve for y. And so the question to ask here, uh, which leads us to something useful, is what happens when I take the limit as x approaches infinity of plus or minus b over a square root x squared minus a squared. And the answer, of course, is that when x is large, I know this additive, or in this case subtraction term, is negligible. That is, it becomes very small in comparison with x squared. So for large x, I know that if we ignore the minus a squared, what I really have there is plus or minus b over a times the square root of x squared, which would be an absolute value of x, and that just really turns into plus or minus b over ax. So let's put it this way. Um, y is roughly equal to plus or minus b over ax when x is large. Of course, we know when we start finding statements like this that we're talking about asymptotic behavior. And when we came up with things like this in Calc 1, when we were talking about rational functions, uh, this sort of statement led us to conclude that the lines y equals plus or minus b over x, b over x, were slant asymptotes. And that's the case here. Uh, y equals b over ax and y equals negative b over ax are slant asymptotes. Now, what does that mean in terms of the graphing? Well, actually, it, it gives you something very useful to graph hyperbolas. Uh, and in fact, uh, since we're ready to start looking at examples, uh, let's do this in reverse instead of starting with the parabola. Uh, let's start with a hyperbola, an easy one, and we'll walk through how to graph it. So let's look at this example. Uh, 9x squared minus 16y squared equals 144. All right, now, of course, uh, as you do more of these problems, you'll get used to recognizing uh, which is which. And if you're thinking about the forms for a hyperbola, first of all, you should be able to spot that if this is anything, it's a hyperbola, since one of the terms is positive and the other term is negative. And if I think about the general forms that we just developed, our two formulas, one was x squared over a squared, minus y squared over b squared equals 1. The other was y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared equals 1. I can see that my equation uh, must align with this one since it's the x squared term that's positive. Now what's the other thing you need to make these equations work? You're supposed to have that 1 on the other side of the equation you can see clearly that there is one way to do that, and that would be to divide both sides by 144. And of course, if you do that, you get some nice numbers, x squared over 16 minus y squared over 9 equals 1. Okay, again, I'm not looking at which one of those denominators is bigger. That's what I do for the ellipse. For this one, since I'm looking at a positive term and a negative term, I look at the positive term, and whatever that denominator is, that's a squared, which means I'm going to identify b squared as that other denominator. Okay, what is the equation that relates a, b, and c, where again c is that number I need to determine the focus? What's the equation that relates a, b, and c for the hyperbola? It's c squared equals a squared plus b squared. So in this case, that means c squared equals 25. So that means c equals 5. So a is 4, b is 3, c is 5. 
and I know from the fact that the positive term is the one that has the x squared in it, that tells me that it's a hyperbola with branches that open to the left and to the right. Okay, so let's put this all together. Uh, let me get out of here and go to graph. Okay, so we said a was 4. So if a is 4, that would put one of my vertices at 4, 0, and the other one at negative 4, 0. Okay, what else do I know? I know that the focal length is 5, so that means since the focal axis is along the x-axis, I should have foci at 5, 0, and negative 5, 0. Okay, what else do I know? Well, I'm going to go ahead and plot these two points, even though they're not actually points on the graph. I'm just going to go ahead and locate points for my own reference at 0, 3, and 0, negative 3, because I know that I can use those two points and the two vertices as anchors for my little box. And that, of course, just tells me that y equals 3 fourths x and y equals negative 3 fourths x should be my slant asymptotes. In particular, there's one of them. And here's the other one. Okay, and I didn't center that very well at the origin, but we'll just pretend that I did. And what I've got there is just a picture of my vertices in blue, my foci in red, and I've gone ahead and sketched the slant asymptotes. Now, I know the two branches open left and right. I know that those branches are anchored at the vertices, which is 4, 0, negative 4, 0. So now I just draw basically parabolic looking pieces, but I know they're hyperbolic branches. And of course, since those green dashed lines are asymptotes, they're supposed to suggest that as the absolute value of x gets bigger, let's try that again. As the absolute value of x gets bigger, I know the graph should be getting closer and closer to those asymptotes. So my graph should look something like this. And it doesn't have to be pretty as long as it your picture conveys something like this. So that's a typical looking uh, picture you would see in the back. They were asking you to graph a hyperbola. They might even, uh, I believe in this book, actually show a sketch of that little dash box, the, the guide that you're using to draw those slant asymptotes. All right, let's go back to our page and do some more. Okay, we're going to mix it up here and let's just try a few different things. Um, how about um, x equals negative 2y squared? Okay, now, this is where when you're doing these, of course, it would make sense to have a little sheet or notes on the side where you have the different formulas laid out for yourself. And, of course, I know that in the equations for the ellipses and hyperbolas, there are both x squared and y squared terms. I see this equation has only a square on the y and a first power on the x, and I know only the, hyper or only the parabola has basic equations like that. And I know the equations for the hyper, or I keep saying hyperbola, but for the parabola are x squared equals 4py or y squared equals 4px. Okay, which one do I want? I want the one that's got the square on the y, which would be this one. 
what do I need to identify the pieces and the p-value? I need to isolate y squared on one side, which means I could say negative one-half x equals y squared, just dividing both sides by negative 2. Okay, once I have that, I should be able to align that with my formula. And when I do that, I realize that lining up y squared equals 4px with y squared equals negative 1 half x means that 4p has to be equal to negative 1 half, which means p equals negative 8. Okay, what does that tell me? It tells me we're talking about a parabola. It's definitely a parabola that opens to the left or the right. Now, since p is negative, that tells me that my focus should be at negative 8, 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So there's my focus point. Okay, what else do I know? I know that there should be a directrix on the other side of the y-axis at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, positive. So right here, there should be a vertical directrix. And then, of course, my graph has its vertex there. And if you were graphing this, I'm going to be sloppy here and just draw a rough picture, but you could certainly plot a few points using this equation. So for example, I could plug in x equals negative 1, or actually let's try something nicer. How about, uh, how about x equals negative 4? If I plug in x equals negative 4, I get negative 4 equals negative 2y squared. I get y squared equals 2. I get y equals plus or minus the square root of 2. So that means when x is negative 4, I'm up here at about 1.4. So 1, 2, 3, 4, and up almost 1.5. And, and same thing down. So of course my graph looks something like this. And I'm being very sloppy there. But again, the idea is just to show where the vertex is, where the focus is, where the directrix is, and obviously which way the graph is opening up, down, left, right. Uh, but mostly it's about identifying which conic you're dealing with, and then of course being able to pick out these parts. Let's try another. Um, how about 2x squared plus y squared equals 4. Um, again, because of the plus and because of the two squares that you see on both terms, that alone should be able to tell me that it's an ellipse. Now, of course, in this case, how do I identify the a, b, and c and get uh, information I can actually use to graph? I know the key is getting this guy to be a 1. So that means I just divide by 4. So what do I get? x squared over 2 plus y squared over 4 equals 1. So x squared over 2 Ugh. Let's try that again. So x squared over 2 and y squared over 4 equals 1. Okay, again, remember that for the ellipse, the a squared is the larger denominator. You're not asking which term is positive or negative because they're both positive. So I just grab which denominator is the bigger one. It's definitely the 4. That means a squared is equal to 4. I take the b squared to equal the, the denominator in the other term. So that means, in this case, a is 2, b is square root of 2. Okay, what about the c, which I also want, because I want to see where the foci are. Okay, I know the equation that relates a, b, and c for the ellipse is a squared equals b squared plus c squared. 
And in this case, that just means c squared, or let's just uh, cut to it. If a squared equals b squared plus c squared, that means c squared equals square root a squared, or c squared equals the trying to do too many things at once here. a squared equals b squared plus c squared. So c equals the square root of a squared minus b squared is what I'm trying to say, which means in this case, c would be the square root of 4 minus 2. c would be the square root of 2. Now, you, you don't see this very often where the c value is the same as the b value, but that can happen. Uh, what's that going to look like in our picture here? Well, first of all, let's graph the vertices. Okay, since since this guy was where the a came from, since that was a squared, and that's in the y direction, I know I should go up and down too. And that's going to give me the endpoints of my semi-major axis. Since this was the b squared, and that means b was square root of 2, then I should go left and right from the center along the x-axis to the right square root of 2 to the left square root of 2. So that would put me somewhere right about here and somewhere right about here. And if I zoom in a little bit, again, we're saying that's about 1.4 and about 1.4. And I'd say probably my one on the left looks a little bit too far. Let's try something more like that. And we'll do our best impression of an ellipse. Something like so. Now, what about the C? We said C was square root of 2, okay, which again is 1.4. That just means that the focus points, which lie along that semi-major axis, which is going from negative 2 up to 2 along the y-axis, it means my foci would sit right about here and right about here. And that's all there is to it. For an ellipse, as long as I'm identifying the center, which of course for this one and for all the ones we've done so far is the origin, and the four vertices and the foci, that's all I need to know. Okay, let's try another. So we've done sort of a, a basic hyperbola, a basic ellipse, and we did a basic parabola. Now, what, what's the limitation we've put on all these examples so far? They've all been conic sections where the center has been at the origin. So now let's start shifting things around a little bit. Um, let's try the following. Let's try looking at this equation. 2x squared plus 2y squared minus 28x plus 12y plus 114 equals 0. All right, now, of course, this doesn't look like any of the basic equations we just talked about, but, of course, I do key off one thing. I do see two square terms and I see that they're both positive. And if I'm trying to uh, align that with what I know, the only one that would seem to fit is the ellipse. Alright, so if I'm going to do that, I want something that uh, has some sort of form like x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1 or I switch the a squared and the b squared. Whichever term has the larger denominator will just determine whether it opens wider horizontally or vertically. All right, now, the problem is uh, I've got all these extra terms in here, that is, all of this stuff, but I'm sure you have a pretty good idea how to handle that. If I group the x things together, as in the 2x squared minus the 28x, and I group the y terms together, the 2y squared and the 12y, uh, 
uh, when I write it that way, it should jump right out at you what I have in mind. I'm thinking about completing the square here. Completing the square in the x and also completing the square in y. So I'm doing two completing the squares. If I do it for the x, of course, I've got 2 times x squared minus 14. And if I factor out the 2 for the y, I've got 2 times y squared plus 6y. And this should have been a 14x right here. Okay, what do I do for the x part? I complete the square inside the parentheses. And so I have x squared minus 14x. Half of 14 is 7. 7 squared is 49. I'm also going to complete the square inside the parentheses there on the y, which means I'd have y squared plus 6y plus half of 6 is 3. 3 squared is 9. Okay, notice, of course, uh, be careful, and you've seen this before back when we were doing these completing the square operations in some of those inverse trig integrals. When I inserted this 49, what I've really added to the equation is 2 times 49. When I inserted the 9 here, what I really inserted was a 2 times 9. So, of course, 2 times 49 is 98. Since I've added a 98, I should also subtract a 98. Since I've added an 18, I should also subtract an 18. Obviously, that would be equivalent to adding 98 and adding 18 on the other side of the equation. You can look at it that way as well. So it looks like what I've got then is 2 times x minus 7 quantity squared plus 2 times y plus 3 quantity squared. Uh, and I can go ahead and combine these all together now if I want to, which would give me um, 28. And I realize now that I must have uh, made a mistake when I copied this problem down, so I'm going to change one thing on you. Uh, let's change... Let's change this, this plus, oh, I see what I did. I just didn't copy my number right. Assuming that I copied it right out of the book, that's a 114. Does everybody see why I've noticed a problem there? I'm doing it again. Got to hang up about 144, I guess. Uh, what's going to happen down here when I take 144 minus 98 minus 18? Uh, 98 plus 18 is less than 144, so this is going to be a positive number. And when I move it to the other side of the equation, it's going to be negative. Um, and that's going to have no solutions at all. That would be an empty set. Um, so if this is now 114 and this part is minus 116, and that's going to make minus 2. That's better. In fact, that actually makes this a really nice, easy one. Let's try that. So this was all minus 2. Which means, of course, I've got 2 times x minus 7 squared plus 2 times y plus 3 squared equals 2. Now, obviously the difference here now is I see my square, I see my square. That does strike me as an elliptical type equation, except I see the number on the other side of the equation is a 2. Uh, we know the fix for that every time is to divide by that number itself. What I end up with in this one is a really simple x minus 7 squared plus y plus 3 squared equals 1. All right, now I've, I've chosen to do this one uh, to remind you of several different things. Number one, you should definitely recognize that this is the equation of a circle. Uh, from what you did in college algebra in the past, uh, 
you realize that the center of that circle should be 7, negative 3, and the radius should be 1. Okay, now, what happens when I have x squared over a squared uh, plus y squared over b squared equals 1? And it turns out that a squared and b squared, or a and b, are the same number. Well, notice what happens if that b squared is actually the same thing as a squared. Then, of course, when you multiply both sides of the equation by a squared, you get x squared plus y squared equals a squared, and you get a circle. And you do remember that the circle was one of the cross sections I was able to get when I took that plane and intersected the bottom map in that set of double cones. And so what I'm going to say is a circle is a, and don't laugh at this word, a degenerate, degenerate conic section. Okay, the, the proper conic sections, I'll use the word proper, are these three that we've been talking about. The ellipse, the parabola, the hyperbola. And, and actually, this isn't correct, what I just wrote. I'm sorry, I'm thinking ahead. That The circle is actually its own special case of an ellipse. So different books will mention this or, or talk about this differently. There are certainly books that will say uh, a circle is an ellipse, but not every ellipse is a circle. Some books will make a very uh, strident effort to differentiate circles and ellipses completely. Uh, but obviously... A circle is a special case of an ellipse. It's the case in which A and B are equal. Okay, so I, I'm crossing out this statement here. This is not correct when I said degenerate. But what I do mean by degenerate is all of the other things we talked about when we were intersecting that plane with those two cones, like the intersecting pair of lines, the point, the single line. Uh, those are definitely not proper conic sections. The circle is the one that can be considered a conic section because it's really just a special case of the ellipse. So circles you're well acquainted with. Uh, you know how to get equations for those. Uh, you know that the general equation is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. And you can see now exactly how that relates to the equation of an ellipse. Um, the other thing I would like to say about circles and ellipses is that you recall from college algebra if h is positive and k is positive then when you take the equation x squared plus y squared equals r squared which is a circle centered at the origin and you replace the x by an x minus h and you replace the y by a y minus k uh, we proved to you in college algebra that what that actually did was shift the graph h units to the right and k units up, in which case if h is positive and k is positive and h comma k was a point over there, my circle is now somewhere over here centered at h k, meaning the form you were taught in college algebra and when you were talking about shifting things up and down you figured out how this works that when you replace x by x minus h and you replace y by y minus k in an equation it shifts your graph h units to the right and k units up if h and k are both positive all right now we need that idea because, of course, the next few examples, we want to build on this and make sure we know how to shift conic sections left, right, up, down. So let's do a couple more quick examples. Let's try this one. y squared minus 6y plus 3x plus 2. Okay, again, should jump right out at you. Since the y is squared, but there's no x squared, this has to be a parabola. Uh, 
Since it's the y that's squared, this tells you it should be a parabola that opens left or right. Uh, that looks too much like a hyperbola. Let's just say opens left or right. Okay, we'll figure out which in a minute. Now, can you tell here that since there is a y squared term and a y term, that there's going to be some sort of completing the square that I'm going to have to do to produce a square term that involves y? Okay, once I notice that, I know there is some sort of shifting going on here. All right, so let's go ahead and do the completing the square, and we'll figure it out. Obviously, it should be y squared minus 6y plus 9 minus 9 plus 3x plus 2. And this is supposed to be equal to 0, by the way. And, of course, I did that to complete the square here and get y minus 3 squared. And if I simplify what's left here, I would have a 3x minus a 7. All right, what are my two basic forms, my focal forms for the parabola? x squared equals 4py and y squared equals 4px. Okay, which one do I need to model this after? It should be the one that has the square on the y. Okay, let's look at that. y squared equals 4px. Now, you do realize that if I could write this equation as something that looked like y minus k squared equals 4p times x minus h squared, this would definitely be a conic, a parabola in fact, centered not at 0, 0, but at hk. All right, now in my case, I can clearly see what the k is. I can see the k is 3. Okay, what about the h? Well, that's easy. I definitely need to separate the y stuff on one side of the equation from the x stuff on the other side. Now, I have all the y stuff together here. So, more to the point here, when I look at these two, I realize those two have to go together. If I move that stuff to the other side of the equation, what I have is y minus 3 squared equals minus 3x plus 7. Okay, notice what I get on this right side if I factor out the negative 3, which I need to do because if I look at my general form right there, I can see that the inside should be a coefficient of 1 on the x and there'll be some other number there, a plus or minus something. That's the part I'm going to look at to figure out how much I'm shifting left or right to get my new center. This part that I'm factoring outside, that's going to tell me what the p is. Obviously, it's the negative 3 that I have to factor out. And when I do, what I get is a minus 7 thirds. Now, question, does this look like y minus something squared equals something times x minus h? If it does, I know hk is the center. And in this case, that means h, which is 7 thirds, and k, which is 3, is the center. Can I tell what P is? Well, obviously, the P is this guy, but that has to be negative 3. I'm sorry, 4P is this guy. So that means 4P equals negative 3. That means P must be equal to negative 3 fourths. Okay, let's put that all together. So what did we say? We said the center was 7 thirds 0. I'm sorry, 7 thirds uh, 3. And we said the p-value was negative 3 fourths. 
Okay, so the center is 7 thirds, so that's 2 and a third, so 2 and a third, 3, which would be like right about here. Just eyeballing it. Okay, so just be careful with about, about what that p equals negative 3 fourths mean. You know that if that p value is positive, it means you would go up if this was a parabola that opened up or down, and you would go to the right if it was a parabola that opened left or right. If p is negative, then you would go down if it's a parabola that opens up or down. You'd go left if it's a parabola that opens left or right. Since this equation had the y squared in it, you know this is one that opens left or right. The fact that p is negative tells me that I should leave my center, my vertex, and I should go to the left because this is a parabola that opens to the left. And you don't have to think that hard about it. Just uh, take the sign on the p and do what it says. Go to the left. All right, so if my coordinates here are 7 thirds 3, and I want to go to the left 3 fourths, it means my new x coordinate is going to be 7 thirds take away 3 fourths. But of course, if I'm just moving to the left, my y coordinate should still be 3. And of course, that means I'm going to have, what, uh, 28 minus 9 twelfths. So I'm going to have 19 twelfths comma 3. So like 1 and 7 twelfths, so a little more than 1 and a half. So a little more than 1 and a half comma 3. And we're saying this guy would be 19 twelfths comma 3. There's my focus. All right, now obviously from there a good picture would require me to uh, make a table and plot a few points, but I'll just draw a rough picture. Not that rough. So, you know, something like, something like this. And obviously it is the location of that focus that would determine how wide that parabola opens. Uh, but I'm just drawing a rough picture there. And just to illustrate that the main things I'm looking for are going to be that vertex and that focus. Now there is one other thing here that uh, it's going to ask for in some questions. So let me back up here a second. Not that far. Let's resize that eraser. It's way too big. Okay, that's better. Okay, so we said that this vertex was 7 thirds comma 3. What's the other thing that's missing in this picture that you might be asked for in some questions? The directrix. And the directrix is what? It's on the other side of the vertex. Well, if I moved left 3 quarters to get to that focus, I would just have to move right 3 quarters. So if I added 3 quarters to my 7 thirds, that would get me the new x coordinate, which would be the location of that directrix, which would be what? It would be the 28 plus the 9 over the 12, which in this case would be 37 over 12. So at x equals 37 over 12, which is a little more than 3, somewhere right about here, that's where I would have my directrix. And of course, obviously, what we're saying is this distance should be the same as this distance. OK, that's a pretty typical uh, parabola problem. It also gives you an example of, of how to handle the shifting. The big thing is what? Once you locate the central point of interest, which for a parabola is the vertex, and for the ellipse and the hyperbola, it's the so-called center, you really need to locate that center first. And then once you find your P or your A or your B or whatever the parameter is according to which conic section you're working on, you just have to move up, down, left, or right from that center point. So in the case of, for example, an ellipse, once you found your center, if you determined what A and B were, you'd have to move left and right and up and down by A and B.
So let's do one more general graphing question. Just another similar example, just to have one more. So let's try something like this one. Um, 3 times x minus 1 squared plus y plus 2 squared over 10 equals 4. All right, again, you, you should be getting used to it by now. You, you can tell by looking at this that it's got to be an ellipse. It's not going to be a circle because the coefficients on these two squared terms are not the same. You should also be able to spot, since somebody's already done the squaring, that the center of this ellipse is going to be 1 comma negative 2. In fact, let's pencil that down right now. The center is 1 comma negative 2. So when I draw this ellipse in a minute, I'm going to start at that center, and then I'm going to move out in all four directions according to what I determined for A and B. Now, how do I figure out or how do I work towards figuring out what A and B are? Uh, that's e easy. We know that that guy has to be a 1, so we're back to that again. We should divide everything by 4. If I do that, I'm going to get what? 3 times x minus 1 squared over 4 plus y plus 2 squared over 40 equals 1. Um, notice that when I look at this one, I really do need to look at that as x minus 1 squared over something. That way I can identify this guy as an a squared or a b squared. So notice the way I should really be thinking about this one is that it should be x minus 1 squared over 4 thirds plus y plus 2 squared over 40 equals 1. All right, now, how do I identify the a and the b? For the ellipse, I look at which one of those denominators is bigger. It's clearly that one. It's way bigger. So what that tells me is a squared is equal to 40, and b squared is equal to 4 thirds. Okay, what is the ABC equation? That is the equation that relates a, b, and c for the ellipse. It's a squared equals b squared plus c squared. And we've said this a few times before. That means c is equal to the square root of a squared minus b squared, which in this case means c is equal to the square root of 40 minus 4 thirds, uh, which would be square root of 116 over 3. So now I've got my C, and I could also say up here that A is the square root of 40, and I could say B is the square root of 4 thirds. And if you'd like, I could call this one 2 over square root of 3, or 2 square root of 3 over 3. Um, I could call this one 2 square root of 10. Uh, this one down here, uh, there's nothing really special about rationalizing this, but uh, I could say 116 is 4 times 29, so that would be 2 times the square root of 29 over the square root of 3, uh, which would give me uh, 2 times the square root of 57 over 3, for whatever that's worth. So there are my A and B and C values. And if I was going to graph these, I might want to actually throw these in the calculator just to see where they are. And I do see a mistake here. This should be 87 when I multiplied 29 by 3. So this is 87. Uh, let me throw those in the calculator and see what I get. Okay, I've advanced it just a little bit there. Uh, 
you can check those values and see if that's what you come up with. So I came up with A is 6.32, B is 1.15, C is about 6.22. So that means C is almost up to A, very close. So graph-wise, what does this give us? Let's see, we said the center was at 1, negative 2. So 1, negative 2 puts us right here. Let's zoom in a little bit. All right, what did we say our values were? We said A was... We said A was about 6.32, and we said B was about 1.15, and we said C was about 6.22. All right, which one is bigger, A or B? Of course, A is always bigger when it's an ellipse, and the A squared was under the Y squared term which means I should move up and down by 6.32, which remember the 6.32 was that 2 squared of 10. Okay, so if I move up 6.32 from this center point, then of course I'm going to be at about 4.32, so maybe somewhere right about here. And same thing if I move down from negative 2, I'm going to be down there at about negative 8.32. So maybe somewhere right around here. And that is just an approximation. Of course, what I'm really aware of is this point is really 1, comma, negative 2, plus 2 squared of 10. And I know this point down here is 1, comma, negative 2, minus 2 squared of 10. That's the actual coordinates, the exact ones. Okay, what do I do with that B number? That's the number that tells me to go left or right to get my semi-minor axis. And again, that 1.15 was that 2 squared of 3 over 3. So if I'm at x equals 1 and I go 1 to the right, I'm sorry, I go 1.15 to the right, I'll be right here at about 2.15, somewhere there. And then, of course, if I move to the left, 1.15, I'm going to be over here at negative 0.15 approximately. What is this point? Well, I didn't go up or down. I just moved to the right. I went from a center of 1 to a new point with a coordinate of 1 plus 2 squared of 3 over 3, comma, negative 2. And then, of course, this other vertex on the left is 1 minus 2 squared of 3 over 3, comma, negative 2. Okay, what's the only other thing? Uh, the foci, which I know is adding and subtracting vertically 6.22 to my center point, which is going to put me almost up there and almost down here to where those two vertices are. And I'll just... Uh, I'll just draw it roughly as some point that's very, very close in each case to the vertex. And of course, what we're saying is that red one is what? 1, comma, negative 2 plus the C value, which was that 2 squared of 87 over 3. And then same thing down here, this red point would be 1 comma negative 2 minus 2 squared is 87 over 3. And this isn't going to look so good, but uh, you get the idea if I connect. My ellipse will look something like that, roughly. And I just did one like this just to show you that even if the shifting produces a, B, C values, or if the shifting, in this case it wasn't really the shifting, it's the A, B, and C values that are bad, that's fine. You just uh, pull out a calculator if you need to to figure out what those values are so you know where to plot your points.
And then you can also just write exact representations of each of those coordinates just by adding and subtracting A, B values and C values to the coordinates of your center. And this is the routine for graphing all of these conic sections this way. Okay, let's take a few more minutes here and look at one last thing which is the reflective properties of the conic sections. And you're not going to have to do very much with this. This is more or less uh, one final thing here for your edification about these conic sections. So we're going to look at some applets real quickly just to illustrate what these properties are. And so for the first one, the reflective property of the parabola, uh, what you see in the picture is a parabola with the focus and vertex and directrix given. The green line is a tangent line to the point A on the graph of the parabola. The dark red line, the vertical one, is a line that's parallel to the main axis of the parabola. That is the vertical line that goes right down through the vertex. Uh, let's imagine that that dark red line is the path of a particle that's approaching the parabola. So it comes from the top down towards the parabola. It hits the parabola. What's it going to do when it hits the parabola? It's going to reflect. What this picture shows is then it would what, that when it reflects, it's going to reflect along a path that will take it to the focus of the parabola. Uh, the reason this is, uh, and I'm not going to prove this here, uh, although there is a problem in your exercises, I'm not going to assign it, but it's in the book where he leads you through the, the proof of this property. But if I said, uh, let's look at the angle between the tangent line and the dark red vertical line, and then let's look at the, the angle between the tangent line and that line segment in red that's dashed from the focus to the point A, those two angles are equal. In other words, if I pictured these two red paths as the path of approach and then the path that the particle leaves the parabola on when it reflects, uh, I would call those respectively the angles of incidence and the angle of reflection. And in this case, those two angles are equal. Uh, this explains why when you look at a parabolic receptor dish, like satellite dish, um, there, there is that little unit uh, that's the receiver that sticks out a little bit in the middle of the parabolic dish. Okay, the location of that receiver is at the focal point. That means when signals come in longitudinally, or let's say parallel to the main axis of that parabola, when they strike the inside of the parabolic dish, they reflect off the inside surface of the dish directly to that receiver point, which is where the focus is. And of course that explains why parabolic shapes are used for receiver dishes of that kind. Okay, the ellipse also has its own property, which we can illustrate quickly with this picture. Okay, so you have an ellipse, you have two focal points, you have a tangent line. Um, if I do what it says and move the slider, okay, notice that if this time the particle was leaving the focus and moving towards that point of tangency, there would be an angle of, let's call it incidence, which is that angle in red. And of course, when the signal reflects off the inside surface of that ellipse, then of course there's going to be an angle of reflection. And the reflective property of the ellipse is such that when a particle leaves one focus and moves towards the elliptical curve and then reflects off that elliptical curve, it's going to reflect to the other focal point, meaning the angle of, oops, Well, hmm. meaning the angle of reflection and the angle of incidence are equal. All right, what's one simple application of this? If you've ever heard of them, they're called whisper rooms. Uh, basically, the ceiling of the room is a semi-elliptical, that is a 3D ellipsoid shape. And so when you, at least theoretically, I've never been in one of these rooms, but when you 
speak and talk towards the ceiling. When your voice hits the ceiling, it will reflect off the ceiling. And because of the reflective property of the elliptical shape, your voice will travel down to the other focal point. Meaning if you were standing at one focus in this room and the other person was standing at the other focus at the other end of the room, then when you whispered quietly toward the ceiling, uh, supposedly the person at the other end of the room standing at that other focal point will hear you. Uh, whereas someone standing a few feet away might not hear what you're saying. Uh, that's the theory anyway. I've never actually been in one of those rooms. Okay. Oops. Here's the last one. Reflective property of the hyperbola. Okay, and this one, again, let's consider up here at the top where it says source. Let's say some particle is being emitted from that source, so it travels down the orange line towards the point P. Notice that, that that line goes through the point P and also through one of the two foci, F1. So we're saying if a point or particle leaves some external source and travels along a line that passes through a point on the hyperbola and one of the two foci, then of course as it travels towards that focus, first it's going to hit the hyperbolic curve. When it does, it's going to reflect, assuming that's a reflective surface. When it reflects, where does it go? Well, follow that other orange line, the one labeled reflection, and where it's going to reflect is the other focus of the hyperbola, the point F2. So what in particular is the reflective property of the hyperbola? If you draw that green dash tangent line to that point P on the graph of the hyperbola, then we're saying when you draw two lines, one through that tangent point and one focus, and the other point through the other focus in that tangent point, that the angles those two lines make with that tangent line are both equal. And if that's the case, when this point from outside, this signal, is directed towards P along a path that would take it to F1, then when it hits P, it will reflect off that hyperbolic surface, or that hyperbolic curve, and reflect to the other focus. Um, this one has an important application in nautical navigation. Uh, it's been in use for a long time called the Lorentz system. Um, so all of these are used in various ways, and the ones I mentioned are just a few of the, the typical ones that are usually mentioned in textbooks like this. Okay, these are interesting, but uh, nothing we're going to, to do anything with here. And so we'll stop right there.